Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brian Tremont. I'm the managing partner at Wilkinson Barker Nauer and the chair of the Telecommunications and Media Practice Group of the Federal Society. I want to welcome you all and thank you all for joining us both here in the room as well as on the live stream around the country. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to encourage folks, uh, practitioners as well as law students to join our practice group. Uh, we do a lot of interesting programming in this area and you would very much be welcome to join us. I also would be remiss if I did not thank Dean and Erica who do such an amazing job with the telecommunications practice group and all the practice groups at the Federalist Society. So thank you for your support for making today possible. Uh, today it is my honor to kick off our discussion of the current telecommunications landscape by introducing FCC Chairman Ajit Pai. Uh, Ajit, the chairman, uh, hails from the great state of Kansas, where he continues to, uh, and he continues to be a diehard Chiefs fan. Uh, prior to joining the FCC, he held a number of uh, posts, both in the private sector, as well as in the executive, judicial, and legislative branches, or uh, alternative interpretations, he couldn't hold one job. But uh, depending on how you think about it, <laughs> Uh, he has been a commissioner at the SEC since 2012 and its chair um, since January of 2017. He's an extraordinary leader and friend, uh, both to the bar, to me personally, and to the Federalist Society. Uh, in support of the society, he has participated in both student chapter visits, uh, a number of teleforums, uh, national press club events, and this indeed marks his second appearance here at the National Lawyers Convention. So it is a great honor to introduce FCC Chairman Ajit Pai. Thank you so much, Brian, for that kind introduction, notwithstanding the fact that you briefly channeled my mother and her constant concerns that I just can't keep a job for more than two years. But, uh, but I did introduce her to Judge Judy, so I think I'm clear for the next couple of years at least. Uh, I also want to note uh, the passing, unfortunate passing this morning of Oscar-winning screenwriter William Goldman. Uh, Mr. Goldman, as you know, was the uh, screenwriter behind some of the greatest films of all time, All the President's Men, uh, Butch Cassidy, and one of my personal favorites, uh, The Princess Bride. And uh, as an homage, there were many ways I was thinking about kicking off my remarks. Uh, you know, inconceivable, or, you know, my name is Inigo Montoya, I'm, you killed my father, prepared to die. Um, instead, I thought I would just stand before you for the next 60 minutes and try to deliver some, you know, the classic line, Mowage. Mowage is what wings us together, but uh, in the interest of time, though, I'll try to speed things up a little bit. I also want to recognize uh, one of the uh, legends of the bench and a tremendous public servant, Judge Jerry Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Uh, in addition to being the first employer for my law school roommate, uh, he also was the employer of our current general counsel at the FCC. Uh, he also celebrated his birthday recently, belated happy birthday. Uh, you only turned 29 once, so I hope you make it count. And uh, uh, thank you for ho moderating the panel, uh, which is to follow. And thanks as well to the panelists, who are just spectacular. They have forgotten more about this field than I'll ever know, so I'll probably just end up vamping for the next 15 minutes. Anyway, to the prepared remarks, uh, much to my sh staff's chagrin, I've been ad-libbing thus far. It is great to be with you at the Federal Society National Lawyers Convention. Now, the theme of this convention is good government through agency accountability and regulatory transparency. And that's exactly what we've been aiming to do at the Federal Communications Commission over the last 22 months that I've had the privilege of serving as the chairman. Uh, for example, the FCC now publicly releases drafts of the items that we're gonna be voting on at our monthly meetings at least three weeks ahead of time. Now that seems like a common sense step to most average Americans, but it is actually quite radical. Before I became chairman, the FCC had refused to release these drafts publicly. Instead, the commission had to pass an order before the American people could see what was in it. And we have changed that, I think, much to the better. Um, to say the least, I think it would be scintillating for you to uh, here at length, the various process reforms we've introduced in parts 47 of the Code of Federal Regulations to improve accountability and transparency. But the solons at the Federal Society have given me a different charge uh, to give you an overview of some of the big substantive issues that we're working on at the Commission. Uh, the panel to come is going to dive into some of the legal issues that are involved. So I will focus on 
Instead, uh, what the FCC is doing to promote American leadership in some of the most promising sectors in the digital economy. And in particular, I'd like to talk about next generation wireless technology and the space industry, which some of you may be surprised has key tie-ins with the FCC. Now, before getting into the specifics, I thought it would be helpful to walk through some of the first principles that inform and guide my approach to the job as FCC chairman. First off, I deeply believe in the importance of regulatory humility. History has shown us without a doubt that markets deliver far more value than preemptive regulation, and that a competitive free market is probably the most powerful force we have for driving technological innovation and producing consumer benefits. The public interest, in my view, is best served when uh, the private sector has the incentives and the ability and the freedom to in create and to invest. And instead of micromanaging markets, I think that the government should eliminate unnecessary regulatory barriers that can stifle new discoveries and services. And in particular, the government should strive to minimize regulatory uncertainty, which can deter long-term investment decisions. Now, uh, talk of regulatory red tape may seem small bore and a bit cliched at this point, but just, just this past week, uh, my former law school professor, Cass Sunstein, uh, published an op-ed that does a great job of illustrating the scale and the costs of this challenge. Meeting the paperwork burdens imposed by our government annually requires 9.78 billion, with a B, hours of labor every year. That's over 1 million years at an estimated cost of $215 billion. So streamlining government regulations isn't an ideological position or a luxury. It's an imperative that serves our public interest. Now, returning to this notion of regulatory humility, I also believe that we should be skeptical towards a preemptive regulation of new technologies, rules that try to predict market failures before they actually occur. Instead, I believe that a careful case-by-case -case approach to evaluating new technologies is more likely to maximize consumer welfare in the long run, give innovators a chance to create, and allow case-by-case -case, uh, enforcement after the fact. This is the best way to secure technological progress and consumer protection at the same time. Uh, now, let me talk about how we're trying to put these principles into place, starting with our work to promote 5G wireless technology. Uh, for those of you who don't live, sleep, eat, and breathe telecom policy, which would probably guarantee your sanity, 5G is the next generation of wireless connectivity. And it promises dramatic improvements over 4G LTE, which most of us know. Well, how dramatic, you might ask? Uh, think of speeds up to 100 times faster, if not faster than that. Uh, the lag time between a device's request for data and the network's response will be less than one-tenth of what it is today. Wireless networks that today support 1,000 connected devices per square kilometer could instead support one million. So basically, a 5G world will effectively remove speed and responsiveness and capacity as meaningful constraints on wireless innovation. And this is going to open the door to many new services and applications that will help grow our economy and improve our standard of living. Uh, for instance, think about smart transportation networks that could link connected cars, reducing traffic, uh, preventing accidents, and limiting pollution. Uh, think about ubiquitous wireless sensors that enable healthcare professionals to remotely monitor your health and intervene quicker if they see that your vital signs are heading south. Think about connected devices that empower farms to apply precision agriculture. Or something that's a little bit personal to me, think about apps that alert you to the possibility that drafting a holdout running back in the first round of your fantasy football draft might be a bad idea. And I say that as a very bitter Le'Veon Bell drafter in one of my leagues. I haven't heard the rest of it from my in-laws, but I will over Thanksgiving. Anyway, not that I'm bitter. But these and even more applications, some of which we can't even conceive today, are on tap if we get it right with respect to 5G. And these breakthroughs are going to boost our economy on a macro level. One study by Accenture, for instance, uh, pegs 5G's potential at 3 million new jobs, $275 billion in private investment, and $500 billion in new economic growth. And so this is not chump change that we're talking about. Now, to seize the opportunities of next generation wireless technology, the FCC is pursuing what we call our 5G FAST plan, a plan to facilitate America's superiority in 5G technology. And this approach includes three key components. Number one, freeing up spectrum for the commercial marketplace. Number two, promoting wireless infrastructure. And number three, modernizing our regulations. And let me briefly walk through each of those uh, areas with a few highlights. Uh, the first, of course, being spectrum. 
the FCC has been extremely aggressive in making more airwaves available for the commercial marketplace. This week, for example, we launched the first of two auctions, the first ever in America, of high band spectrum that was previously thought to be useless, but now can be used for 5G, thanks to advances in technology. And we're on track to auction off three more spectrum bands next year. We're also exploring how to repurpose mid-band spectrum for new wireless applications from rural broadband coverage to the next generation of Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And we're working hard with other federal agencies to make available spectrum that's currently held by the federal government, which has held a majority of lower band airwaves for some time. Now to put all of these efforts in perspective, we are aiming to free up more spectrum over the next 15 months or so than is currently held by every mobile broadband provider in the United States combined. So this is a massive influx of supply into the spectrum that we currently have available. But the second part of our 5G fast plan is infrastructure. All the spectrum in the world won't make any difference if we don't have the physical networks, the infrastructure that is necessary to carry 5G traffic. And that's going to be a challenge, uh, to be candid with you. And that's because the 5G networks of the future will look very different from the 4G networks that we know today. Today, we see 200-foot cell towers intermittently dotting the landscape. But tomorrow's 5G networks will rely more heavily on smaller infrastructure, things called small cells, uh, less conspicuous equipment, sometimes no bigger than a backpack, and uh, equipment that's more densely deployed and operating at lower power. And that's because the closer an antenna is to a phone, the less power is required to connect the two of them. So we'll need an estimated 800,000 new cell sites by 2025. And for context, we barely have over a quarter of that today. So we'll also need a lot more fiber optic lines to connect all those small cells to the core of these networks. Now the problem is that the hundreds of thousands of small cells and the many miles of fiber needed for 5G will not be deployed unless we have a regulatory approval process that encourages build out. And just to give you a sense of the problem, consider this. When I came into office, it took, and still does take, roughly one or two hours to install a small cell on a utility pole. But it can routinely take one or two years or more to get the regulatory approval to install that antenna, especially at the state and local level. Another short-sighted pr uh, problem is short-sighted local arbitrage on fees. Siting fees per small cell can be as low as $50 in a forward-thinking, investment-friendly place like Phoenix, Arizona, but it can be as high as $5,000 elsewhere. And those fees can quickly add up and deter investment altogether. And so that is why the FCC has modernized its wireless infrastructure rules and why we will keep doing so. Earlier this year, we reformed our environmental and historic preservation regulations to make clear that small cells do not have to jump through the same regulatory hoops that would apply to a 200-foot cell tower. In this September, we approved an important order promoting 5G infrastructure. We set a reasonable 60-day shot clock for cities to rule on small cell siting applications and a reasonable time limit on siting, uh, limit on siting fees, limits that allow localities to recover their costs. Uh, so that's spectrum and infrastructure. That takes me to the third uh, leg of the uh, 5G stool, which is modernizing our regulations. Uh, as you might have heard, uh, the FCC has been pretty busy revising or repealing outdated regulations to promote investment in the wired backbone of these 5G networks. Uh, for instance, when I became chairman, we had regulations on the books that made it too hard for carriers to transition from the fading copper networks of yesterday toward the more resilient fiber networks of tomorrow. And so we've updated those rules to help companies focus on fiber deployment. After all, by definition, every dollar that is spent maintaining a fading copper network cannot be spent deploying next generation fiber. In addition to that, we've also adopted a bold new policy called One Touch Make Ready, essentially which makes it easier for competitive fiber entrants to uh, attach equipment to utility poles and to do so much more quickly. And this is a critical step uh, toward carrying 5G traffic to and from small cells. And we also overturned the previous administration's decision to heavily regulate the internet, including the wireless networks, like a slow-moving utility under rules developed in the 1930s for Ma Bell. And we have... Um, <laughs> and we have replaced that with a consistent national policy for broadband providers, one that protects the free and open internet we all love and encourages infrastructure investment. 
In my view, the internet should be run by engineers and entrepreneurs and technologists, not by politicians and bureaucrats and lawyers. No offense. Uh, and um, <laughs> the lawyers out there who are not clapping, I suspect you're probably on the other side of that. But I'm, <laughs> Uh, but I'm happy to report that our, our policies are working. For example, amidst the prior administration's regulatory onslaught, infrastructure investment in broadband declined in 2015 and 2016, which is the first time we'd ever seen such declines outside of the context of a recession. But in 2017, we reversed that trend. Investment increased, and our preliminary signs from 2018 is that, that trend is increasing. In addition, the internet remains open and free. As I've recently told a number of people who've asked me about how things are going, the internet still works. You can still hate tweet your favorite FCC chairman. <laughs> or post your screenshots of your favorite Judge Smith opinion on Instagram. Whatever floats your boat, it all works. Uh, so now I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk about the main thing the FCC has been focusing on this month, which is not something that people think naturally of when they think of the FCC. And that is space, the space industry in particular. Uh, some quick background here. The global space economy generated about $350 billion of revenue in 2017. And the biggest share of this sector by far is the satellite industry, which accounts for about 75 to 80% over time. Now, what raises my antenna, uh, see what I did there, uh, is the <laughs> prediction in separate reports by Morgan Stanley and by Goldman Sachs that this industry will grow to be a trillion dollar sector by 2040. And so this is a really big market opportunity for the United States and for US companies to innovate and to uh, drive uh, the market. And so how exactly does the FCC fit into this? Well, the FCC regulates a variety of aspects of communication services that are provided in outer space, notably the use of spectrum and the way that certain satellites operate and transmit information back to the Earth. And I talk a lot about the need for the FCC to constantly be evaluating and updating our rules to reflect changes in the marketplace. And it occurred to me last year that it had been almost a generation in some cases since the agency had taken a look at a fresh look at some of the regulations surrounding space. And when you add in the fact that uh, the space industry represents a huge growth opportunity, you find a ripe opportunity to update our rules and to promote investment and innovation in the American space industry. We voted just a few days ago on a number of these proposals. Actually, it was just yesterday. Just I've been aging in dog years, I suppose. Um, and dur during the commission's monthly meeting for November, uh, we adopted about nine or 10 proposals during something that we called Space Month. And the launch of the FCC space agenda yesterday was a huge success. Now, so you might ask, well, what exactly did we do? Well, if you remember those reports I mentioned earlier about how the space industry could be a trillion dollar sector, those same reports identified satellite delivered internet access as the biggest growth opportunity. And it makes sense when you think about it. I mean, the big potential breakthrough here is a new technology that involves launching a constellation of hundreds of small satellites into low Earth orbit, so no, not way out into deep space. And they'll create enough of a mesh network, if you will, uh, of these smaller satellites that internet access could be delivered back to the Earth uh, at a price point and with a speed and with a latency, it would be comparable to something you could get from a company operating here on Earth. And that could be a dramatic game changer, especially for the millions of Americans who are on the wrong side of the digital divide in rural areas, in remote areas, and in tribal areas. In summer 2017, uh, the FCC approved the first of these new constellations of non-geostationary satellite orbit companies, or NGSOs, as they are called. Uh, some of them are from some companies you might know, like SpaceX and OneWeb. Uh, yesterday, the FCC approved four separate petitions from companies seeking to initiate or to expand services that rely on these low Earth satellite uh, constellation systems. And our hope is that this will transform uh, the internet access situation for underserved or unserved rural areas, which could soon enjoy new options for high-speed broadband service, something that they are yearning for. Uh, also, one satellite-based uh, technology that's already proven to be a game changer is the Global Positioning System, or GPS. Now, what, what some may not know is GPS is actually a US-based system. There's also a similar European system called Galileo. And I won't sing the Queen song lyric just to spare you uh, my pipes, but just trust me, it's a, it's a system that actually works. But for many years, we haven't allowed what are called non-federal devices, essentially your smartphone and mine, uh, to receive signals from that Galileo system. 
Well, yesterday we voted to change that. The SEC voted to allow these devices to receive signals and send them to Galileo. And as a result, GPS should become more precise, more reliable, and more resilient for millions of US consumers and businesses. And hopefully this will also enable brand new applications for things like precision agriculture. Uh, another issue we looked at yesterday is the issue of space debris. Uh, most of you probably saw the movie Gravity, uh, Sandra Bullock, George Clooney, you remember this from a few years ago. Well, as you recall, uh, the incident that doomed them when they were on their space flight was getting hit by debris uh, from a dormant satellite. Now, this issue isn't just something that Hollywood imagined. It is quite real. Even something as small as a centimeter of, uh, of space debris can cause catastrophic damage to a satellite or to a spacecraft. And as I just said, the commission has launched, authorized the launch of many satellites into space. So to mitigate the risks of catastrophic accidents, the FCC yesterday voted to launch uh, the first review and update of our orbital debris rule since 2004. Uh, along with some regulatory streamlining, uh, rounding out our space, space Month agenda yesterday was an update of our rules for what are called Earth Stations in Motion, or ESIMS. We just love the acronyms. I don't know why we do that. But anyway, ESIMS involve essentially people who are on the go. If it could be in a plane, a train, or an automobile. Uh, no John Candy references, I promise, but it is a great movie. But anyway, people in these ESIMS often want a connectivity. So yesterday we advanced a proposal to make it a lot easier to deliver high-speed access in these mobile entities. And that could be a dramatic change, especially if you anticipate the era of connected cars and the like, when people are always on the go and aren't actually driving the cars, they could have a lot more free time that they could use to uh, do work, uh, to play, to do whatever it is they like to do. Uh, so I'd like to close, if I might, by coming back to the Princess Bride, uh, one of my favorites uh, lines in that movie is when Buttercup tells Wesley, we'll never survive. And to that, Wesley replies, as you might remember, nonsense. You're only saying that because no one has. Um, one of the things I love about the tech sector, whether it's space or terrestrial innovation, is that this is the default attitude of Americans writ large and of tech innovators in particular. You, you often give them a whole bunch of reasons why things can't be done, and they just say nonsense, and they do it anyway. And from my perspective, at least, that is what the SEC is charged with doing, creating a regulatory framework that allows all of the innovators out there to channel Wesley and to tell the naysayers nonsense. We are determined to innovate. We're determined to invest. We're determined to promote American leadership in all these next generation technologies. And so from our perspective, at least, so long as I have the privilege of serving as the chairman of the agency over the next couple of years, we need to modernize our rules to make this kind of attitude easier to execute, to make business plans real, and to make the consumer benefits that they promise a reality as well. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for the work the Federalist Society is doing to highlight these issues. I look forward to working with the, all of you to in the years to come to secure the benefits of the digital revolution for millions of Americans. Thanks. <laughs>
our, our, our topic is about as broad a topic as I could possibly imagine. It's called telecommunications and electronic media, the current landscape of telecommunications law. That's not very uh, restrictive, and I look forward to the insights from each of our uh, members of the, of the panel. I will uh, introduce uh, uh, our four panelists now and then turn it over to them for uh, for introductory uh, remarks. We will begin with uh, Jamie Suskin, uh, who is the Chief of Staff to FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. She was formerly uh, Chief Counsel to Senator Deb Fisher. Before that, uh, she was detailed from the FCC to be counsel to the Senate uh, Commerce Committee, uh, Subcommittee on, Com on Communications. Uh, she had her, has her undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan and her law degree from the Anton Scalia Law School. Next, we'll... Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> They're already clapping. That's good. You're good. Insane. You're doing great. We will then hear from Kathleen Hamm, who is Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at T-Mobile. She regularly interacts with Congress and the FCC on regulatory and policy issues. She previously uh, served 14 years uh, at the commission, including deputy chief of the Wireless uh, Telecommunications Bureau. And she's been named four times as one of the most influential women in wireless. Her undergraduate degree, <laughs> in, how about that? She has her undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado and is a graduate of the Catholic University uh, School of Law. Next is uh, Dane Snowden who's the Chief Operating Officer of NCTA, the Internet and Tele Television Association. He was previously with uh, the, the Wireless Association as Vice President of External and State Affairs. From 2001 to 2005, he was Chief of the Federal Communication Commission's Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau. Before that, he served in leadership roles in numerous charitable and civic organizations, including the United Negro College Fund. Uh, he's a graduate of William and Mary College. I, sh I should say the College of William and Mary. I got, I'm sorry. <laughs> and our final panelist is Nuala O'Connor, who is president and CEO of the Center for Democracy and Technology, a nonprofit uh, that's committed to advancing digital rights She's had uh, extensive private and public sector legal work, including technology, and associate, she was general, associate general counsel of Amazon. Uh, she's worked in various public agencies, including the Commerce Department uh, and Homeland Security. Uh, she has her BA from Princeton and her JD from Georgetown Law School. Welcome to all of the panelists. Jamie Seskin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to the Federalist Society for inviting me to participate on today's panel um, with such other distinguished members and moderator. Uh, you just had the chance to hear from Chairman Pai about steps that the FC FCC has taken under his leadership to encourage innovation and investment in the tech and telecom space. I'd first like to commend the chairman on the many accomplishments achieved during his tenure. I will not repeat them here since you just heard them from him, uh, but it's an agenda to be proud of and um, I've enjoyed my time back at the agency under his chairmanship. As many of you know, Chairman Pai asked my boss, Commissioner Brendan Carr, to lead the agency's efforts on wireless infrastructure in particular, so I'm going to chat a bit more about what you heard. Um, Chairman Pai say on that front. Uh, the goal that we have had is to make sure that our regulatory structures going forward are ready for 5G and for the new influx of small cells, which we've termed 5G ready. The US is on the cusp of a major upgrade in wireless technology to 5G. The Wall Street Journal has called it transformative from a technological and economic perspective. And it's true. Winning the global race to 5G Seeing this new platform deployed in the U.S. first is about economic leadership for the next decade. The U.S. won the race to 4G. No country had faster 4G deployment and more intense investment than the U.S. Winning this race added $100 billion to our GDP. 
It led to $125 billion in revenue for U.S. companies that could have gone abroad. It grew wireless jobs in the U.S. by 84%. And our world-leading 4G networks now support today's $950 billion app economy. That history should remind policymakers at all levels of government exactly what is at stake. 5G is about our leadership for the next decade. But we're not the only country that wants to be first to 5G, as I'm sure many of you know. One of our biggest competitors is China. They're moving aggressively to deploy the infrastructure needed for 5G. Since 2015, China's deployed 350, uh, 350,000 cell sites. We've built fewer than 30,000 in the US. Right now, China's deploying 460 cell sites a day. That's 12 times our pace. Commissioner Carr believes we need a concrete plan to close the gap with China and win this race to 5G. He, along with his colleagues at the commission, take this challenge very seriously. That means the FCC is working to get the government out of the way so the private sector can deploy the hundreds of thousands of small cells needed for 5G deployment in the US. In March, as the chairman mentioned, we updated federal historic and environmental reviews to reflect new coming 5G technology. While the old rules were written for 200 foot towers, the majority of wireless infrastructure being built nowadays is made up of small cells, often the size of a backpack. These outdated were reviews were not providing any real benefit to Americans, and they had real costs in both dollar figures and in the race to 5G. Uh, a couple of particularly egregious examples. Um, at last year's Super Bowl, one wireless provider spent nearly $180,000 in historic preservation review fees to put small cells on the stadium and on poles in the parking lot um, of the stadium, even though the construction of the stadium itself involved no federal historic review. Uh, another provider paid $12,000 just for a review of a small cell placed between a sidewalk and a highway in Ohio. Um, there's countless examples like this. Our record is full of them, so we knew that something had to be done. The FCC stepped in to fix that broken federal review process, and we held that small cells should not go through the costly and lengthy reviews designed for 200-foot towers. And we're already seeing results. That decision alone cut $1.5 billion in red tape, and one provider reports that it's now clearing small cells for construction at six times its pace as before. So this is great progress, but there are still challenges. The FCC, for a long time, has heard from mayors, local officials, and state lawmakers who understand the economic opportunity that comes with next-gen networks, but they worry that the investment dollars needed to deploy those networks will be consumed by the high fees and long delays imposed by big, must-serve cities. They worry that without federal action, they might not see 5G. So in September, the FCC built on the many smart infrastructure policies championed by state and local leaders. We ensured that every city is compensated for its costs in reviewing and approving small cell deployments while putting guardrails in place to address these excessive fees. We updated our shot clocks that have long applied to local reviews to account for the lower impact of new small cell technology. And we ensured that local governments can take reasonable aesthetic considerations into account when reviewing small cell deployments. These policy changes will equate to about $8,000 in savings per small cell on, on top of the $10,000 in savings from our March decision on federal historic reviews. It's expected to stimulate $2.4 billion in new small cell build out, and that new investment is enough to cover $1.8 million, or excuse me, 1.8 million more homes and businesses with 5G, 97% of which are in rural and suburban communities. That means that next gen connectivity will not be limited just to places like New York City and San Francisco. It will come to places like Pensacola, Florida, and Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which is a win for everybody. This means that all Americans, no matter where they live, will have a shot at next-gen connectivity. So thanks again to the Federalist Society for hosting this panel today, and I look forward to taking your questions. <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. I'm Kathleen Hamm. I, I head up government affairs for, uh, for T-Mobile here in DC, so you can imagine I'm pretty busy right now. Uh, but when Brian asked me and others asked me to speak before the Federalist Society, I thought, this is cool, you know? He throws great wine tastings. Uh, so, but this is my first time um, at, at your event, and wow, there's a lot of you. So, uh, 
so be kind. Uh, I, um, I, I, I'm going to keep my remarks uh, short because I think uh, we'll probably get into it. But I want to thank uh, I want to thank Jamie and I want to thank her boss, Commissioner Carr. They've done just fantastic work, as has the chairman and the, the FCC as a whole, just recently on, on infrastructure reform. 5G is coming. Uh, and uh, when people think about 5G, just so you know, uh, that means it's the fifth time we've built out or built over our networks. Okay, That's what 5G is about. Very expensive prospect. And it is going to require a lot more siting, uh, a lot more small cells as opposed to those big towers. And uh, there's a cost to that. And we also have to have uh, the spectrum to go along with it. And it's taken just uh, great leadership at the FCC, I think, uh, in moving on some of these things, looking to the future, and making sure you know, we have uh, the, the, the correct deregulation in place as well as the spectrum assets in place for that future, because the U.S. is competing globally on this issue. There's no question about it. Uh, and uh, countries like China don't have to worry about uh, uh, localities and ordinances. They just do it, right? And uh, the same thing with Spectrum, making that available. So uh, I mean, I love our democracy. I love everything about it. But uh, sometimes uh, it, things are slower, you know, and, the, and the, the world is competing very fast on 5G. So from T-Mobile's perspective, we're very excited about 5G. Uh, we're, we're looking to roll it out. And uh, we're also hoping to merge with Sprint. Uh, we have that pending before the FCC right now, the Department of Justice, and a number of other um, government agencies at the state level. That combination, the benefit that comes to us with that combination is, and what you really do need uh, for successful 5G deployment, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, is a multi-band approach. So what T-Mobile's doing right now is, is rolling out in what we call the 600 megahertz uh, band, which was returned TV uh, channels. You might have heard about the auction that occurred there. We had. Uh, tremendous results in that auction. And, and the benefit of 600 is it enables you to build out, um, you think about your TV set and be able to penetrate deep into buildings. That's what low band spectrum can enable you to do. It also enables you to go further with the spectrum with fewer cell sites. So it's great for rural coverage. And so T-Mobile now is moving into markets that we've never served before. We just built out Montana, you know. T-Mobile was never in Montana, okay. so. Uh, that spectrum was really important to us from a competitive standpoint. Uh, Sprint has a lot of mid-band spectrum. Uh, that spectrum is also very valuable. And then there is uh, high-band spectrum, mil what we call millimeter wave spectrum. And all of these uh, spectrum bands have different characteristics. And really, for, for 5G to get a very fulsome, broad, high-capacity capability, because of all the cool things the chairman said, uh, that you're going to be able to do with this, you need those assets. And so that's, that's a big part of why we want to merge with Sprint, because we're bringing together low band spectrum, which we have, they don't have, with that mid band spectrum that helps us kind of build that broad, deep, uh, deep capacity. Uh, the other thing I would say is it, it's going to enable us to. Um, to, to do new things, to break into new areas. Uh, there's some really, I've been asked to talk a little bit about convergence, and, and Dane may talk about this too, but uh, you know, cable and wireless are bucking up against each other more and more these days, whether it's for spectrum, uh, whether it's for backhaul, uh, and is Comcast actually added more uh, postpaid uh, customers than AT&T and Verizon combined last year, OK? Uh, so they're breaking into wireless in a, in, a, in a big way. And they have, you know, they have the capability to do it. They have existing customers. They have, uh, they have Spectrum. Uh, yeah, and, and a great network, yeah. So, uh, so the, the two worlds are converging. And it will be really interesting. You know, uh, things are moving very fast on the technology side. It's very exciting. Uh, and. Uh, you know, T-Mobile's trying to, to get itself uh, uh, in, a, in a good position to be able to compete. Uh, you know, a lot of people think our merger is about going from four to three. 
We see it as going from two to three because we want to be a stronger third uh, competitor to AT&T and Verizon for certain, and also to Comcast and, and Charter and Altice, all of whom filed in our merger docket, by the way, which was interesting, uh, you know, to as they enter this space. So the, there is convergence going on. There is, uh, the world is changing. It's all very exciting. And I'm, I'm very uh, pleased with what the FCC has been doing, both in terms of trying to create the right uh, incentives for investment, uh, try to create the right incentives to deploy more spectrum in the marketplace, and some of the in infrastructure reforms that they've been doing. So uh, more to come on all that, and I'm happy to join the conversation. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for uh, having me here. I am the, I think, the non-lawyer on the panel and probably in the room. So I thought of my favorite quote from Princess Bride, and is, <laughs> it is, life isn't fair, it's just fairer than death. <laughs> Picking up where Chairman Pai left off, uh, I would say that on behalf of the uh, Internet and Television Association, the NCTA, <clears throat> We, we actually we support and applaud what he's doing in terms of uh, openness, transparency, and the collaborative approach that, that this commission has taken um, with our industry, I think with Kathleen's industry as well. Uh, it's great to have that, that spirit of let's come together and let's have a dialogue to figure out how we move these issues forward. The Pi Commission has done a great job on media modernization, and this is something that definitely needs to happen. As we can, I think it's a clear recognition that over the past 20 years, the media landscape has changed, but the rules and regulations have not. And I think what's going on right now at the commission uh, is the right approach, uh, looking at where we're going uh, as we go forward. I'll be very brief today, because I know we want to get to your questions, but I must talk about um, the 5G. Everyone seems to be wanting to talk about that today. Um, <clears throat> and as, as I think T-Mobile and the wireless industry, they build, the, build out their 5G plan, um, we will continue to work hard on building the key infrastructure we need uh, to get us to where we are now. We have about 7% about of our companies offer a gig uh, to their consumers, and we're quickly going towards a 10 gig world. Our infrastructure will be needed for what they want to do in the 5G world. And so there is a lot of, there's competition growing, there's collaboration going, there's, there's we, you, you need us, we need you, we all work together. Uh, and that's the way it, it should go. But I think as we think through the 5G plan, I want to remind everyone there's, there's a plan on the wireline side that needs to make sure we have the regulatory barriers taken down, making sure uh, local franchise authorities aren't getting in the way of the development of what we need to do to ensure that we're providing the services from 1G to, 5G, to, 1G to 10G uh, for, our, for our consumers. And with that, I look forward to answering your questions uh, when we get to that point. Thank you. Dane, that was remarkably brief. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to beat that. And I was thinking, I've got lots of Princess Bride cred, but my favorite quote is, have fun storm in the castle. That might make sense given where I work now and, and what we do, but um, thank you to Judge Smith. Thank you to our beloved Brian Tremont for the invitation. I'm delighted to be back here again. It's been a while since I've been with you. Um, we at the Center for Democracy and Technology are working on a number of relevant issues, including privacy and free expression and anti-surveillance and, and the open and innovative and free internet that the chairman talked about. And we are very much in sync with many of the, the voices represented on this panel. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about our current framework and thinking around individual privacy, but it's very much deeply informed by my time in the Bush administration as the first statutory chief privacy officer at the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Commerce and the head of delegation to the International Privacy Commissioners Conference, a body that was not that significant perhaps in the 1990 and the 2000s when, when we were going, um, but has taken on a new life in the post-Cambridge Analytica uh, era. Um, and trying to explain to the rest of the world what the 
the United States' framework is on individual privacy. And it's not to say we don't have one. We certainly have a good one. It's a sectoral approach. But it took me one time 55 minutes and almost got me booed off the stage and in Sydney, Australia, um, for trying to explain in great depth our terrific enforcement mechanisms. Um, but it really does speak to this new convergence that we're all talking about. The consumer no longer understands whether they're addressing or working with a telecom company or an internet company or whether they're covered by the laws of Delaware or of California. They just want to get online and get their, their stuff done. And as the internet becomes more and more embedded in the walls of our house and in the dashboards of our cars and in our children's schools, the time, I think, has long passed for a more notice, more transparency, more little pieces of paper in your bank statements. I've written more of those, those in my career as a junior lawyer. I like to say I'm the Mark Twain of privacy policies. But, um, <laughs> but that, that, that's not a workable solution anymore, given the speed and the efficiency that we all want to see from a company perspective or from an individual perspective. So I think these are exciting times. I mean, it's, we're certainly thrilled by the interest our corporate uh, partners and the current White House have shown for a, a simple and actionable, a, an easy to understand for both the smallest institutional actor and the largest uh, framework that can both respect the rights of the individual and allow for a robust and vibrant internet in the years ahead. So a single clear standard, one that's uh, across all industry sectors, one that creates an open and level playing field. These are all the questions we are trying to answer. And then what really matters? What matters to the individual? And we've kind of congealed around two words I want to leave you with, and one is immutable. The data that I cannot change about myself, whether it's my fingerprint or my iris scan or my DNA, perhaps deserves a higher level of protection in the internet age. The most intimate of our details, those within the curtilage of our homes and our family lives, also probably just deserve and require additional scrutiny and additional uh, protections, both from a security and a privacy standpoint. So these are the sorts of questions we're trying to answer, again, across in civil society and corporate America and create a better and more durable solution. So thanks for all these opening remarks. The only um, uh, the only thing that's disappointing is that our panelists didn't disagree uh, enough with uh, with each other. Usually we have these opening remarks and the panelists are going at each other's throats and they want to do a response. And we certainly, uh, I certainly want to let uh, any of you comment on what the others have said or anything else that, uh, uh, that you'd like to, uh, uh, to add as we go along. We're going to have plenty of time uh, for questions from, from all of you. Let, let me just throw out one for the reaction from any of you. There's been... Uh, there's been mention here of state and local uh, impediments in terms of, of, uh, of uh, fees and regulations uh, that, that, that may arguably be, uh, be hindering some of the, the development for, for 5G or in, in, in other areas. And uh, a lot of the discussion at this, uh, at this convention this year has been uh, over the question of of, uh, of federal authority versus versus state. Uh, I even heard Professor Richard Epstein yesterday criticize the interstate highway system. So I guess we're going back to first principles about what should be done at the state and local level as opposed to federal. So my question uh, uh, for any of you that would like to comment, and I hope some of you will, is uh, in an ideal world, should there be more or less a federal preemption in in the telecommunications field. Yeah, you go. You take that one. <laughs> I think you have to start and look at how consumers use products as well. Um, sp speaking specifically about some of the impediments from from the cable side, we recently filed um, in the further notice in Section Six Twenty One. We pay three billion dollars in state and local fees. And some of the local franchise authorities are trying to add on additional fees for things we've already paid for. And that just doesn't make any sense. And that just all that it does is add more costs to doing business, which doesn't add up. But when you think of, of preemption, um, you look at privacy. You, you, you can't have privacy rules in one state that are different than another state because that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for the consumer. Net neutrality is another example of that. You, you, which is talking about regulatory uncertainty, um, you, you cannot have a system where you have 49 or 50 or 
or even four different rules in place because it doesn't hurt, it hurts the consumer in the long run. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think, um, you know, there's nothing more inherently interstate than the, than the, the uh, internet, right? And so what we're facing as, as carriers now is not only state by state regulation, but locality by locality. You know, New York City has a net neutrality <laughs> rule. Uh, so it just, it, 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 it's not great for business and it's not great for consumers. It creates a lot of uncertainty, a lot of costs and burdens. So, you know, uh, I think preemption has its place uh, and I'm, I know it's, it tends to be controversial, but I think uh, in the area of the internet and some of the uses that Dane is talking about, I think preemption should be something that should be under consideration. I mean, it's tricky, right? So when I worked on the Hill, um, I think that probably our caucus members were sort of split and it would come up in different areas. Um, I know data breach was a big issue where people would sort of say, you know, do we want 50 different state laws or do we want one national standard? And um, to this day, that's sort of not settled at this point. Um, I think there's ways to do preemption, but there's ways to also respect um, state and local decisions in a way. And so for example, um, the FCC September decision, which yes, was a preemption decision based on what the statute um, you know, prohibits states and localities from doing, um, also tried to respect the, I believe it's 20, and Kathleen can keep me honest, I believe it's 20 states around the country that had already passed small cell legislation um, you know, that was reasonable and that wasn't effectively a tax on 5G infrastructure. So. I think we have to be mindful um, of what state governments are doing and how they represent their constituents because that's also important. Um, but we also have to be mindful about what federal laws like the Communications Act um, direct us to do and what they say that states and localities are prohibited from doing. I think it's worth noting that preemption is not a black and white issue, right? That there are spectrums available, sorry to use the word spectrum in this room, um, you know, that would still allow enforcement at the state level, but would provide the regulatory certainty and the international certainty. And we're looking at threats from the Chinese model of the internet. So I think we need to figure out a US model that wor works and is sustainable. So another question that's more a uh a technical or, or, or science question than, than a legal or, or structural one uh, uh, is, and, and I'm an absolute novice and don't understand any of this technology, but uh, the, uh, the world in this area is moving so fast. I'm just wondering, um, uh, is it possible to start working on 5G and that that's immediately la lapped by some other technology that we don't really know about? I guess my question to be more specific about it is, if we went back three years or five years or 10 years, how, how predictable would it have been what has happened in, in, in telecommunications? Are, are, there, are there ways of, 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 of predicting this and anticipating it, uh, not only for the industry, but, but, but for agencies such as uh, the FCC? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, it's funny, I was at a dinner last night that we hosted with the Economic Club, and one of the women, I had my chief technology officer there, and she asked him, do you, hire, do you have, does T-Mobile have a futurist that works for you? And he was sort of taken aback, and he said, no, not really, no, we don't have a futurist. But it's, you know, looking into the future can be very, Tough, you know, and I, I'm convinced that we're going to start talking about 6G before we've even built out 5G. That's the way it seems to be going. But, you know, looking back, for example, on 4G, the U.S. led in 4G deployment. And what did that lead to? Uh, it led to Uber. We didn't have, you wouldn't have Uber, but for LTE networks. The, the whole app community and everything that that brought to the economy came from those bedrock uh, LTE networks, particularly as um, uh, usage is going up. And one thing I think we do look to, to is that there are things that are gonna come on the horizon that we wouldn't have anticipated, 
but we know that usage is going up. Video is exploding on our networks, for example, more and more video. We're going to have more connected devices, uh, and you're going to have driverless cars. You're going to have all these things, and they're going to need a network, the backbone of a network, to, to actually make it run. And uh, so it's, it's, it's difficult to predict these things, but you do want to make sure that we have, as a country, I think, the assets out there. It takes a long time to make Spectrum uh, come available to market, for example. It's really a 10-year window. Because the problem is there is no, in the US, there is no available spectrum, really. It's all about refarming the existing spectrum. And uh, you know, right now, for example, with the 600 megahertz spectrum that we bought, we bought that in an auction. Uh, broadcasters are on that spectrum now. And T-Mobile's been actively clearing them and moving them to other frequencies or some of them have chosen to go dark. So that is, a, that is a, a, a process. And so whether you're clearing broadcasters or you're clearing federal spectrum, that takes time. And so we need to make sure that we have those, those spectrum assets available to us because we do know use, usage is going to go up and uh, we need to plan for it accordingly. Just to add a little bit, the, the one thing that is not, um, you, you don't look at is the regulations that are out there. The regulations don't keep up at all with the, where technology is going. They can't. We build, rebuild our networks almost every year and take a lot of capital X to do that. And so when we look at what's happening and where society is going, Kathleen mentioned Uber all the way to the increase in video, but also where we see the future in terms of smart cities and what's going to be needed to have smart cities. Um, you, you're going to need a robust network that's building and rebuilding and rebuilding every single year. And that takes a lot of money, of course. Uh, but there is a long range plan that we have in our industry to make sure that, and I'm sure Kathleen does too, but there's a, there's, to ensure that we are providing the network that is needed for today and tomorrow. So, Dane is obviously um, totally right. Uh, government, as everyone in this room knows, does not keep pace with technology, um, it's not designed to do that. Unfortunately, we are behind. So I actually think that the best thing that um, the FCC under Chairman Pai has been doing is you know, rolling back regulations. We've been streamlining. We've been cutting the red tape to get the innovators and the investors up front again. Um, we need to just clear the way so all of the creative innovations that Kathleen mentioned, um, things like Uber, right, can um, develop without us getting in the way. Such a terrific question and, and something we grapple with at CDT because we've had lawyers and technologists proximate to each other now for almost 25 years. Where, and, and I think that's the right question. We are, as humans, really bad at predicting what 25 years is going to look like from now, even more five years from now. Um, we're adding to our staff exactly that kind of you know, sociologist and psychologist and human behaviorist to say, what, is, what impact is technology having on our communities, our cities, our, our, our institutions, and our lives? Um, but we are tremendously under kind of equipped to predict what the impact is going to be on society of a lot of our, our new um, inventions and innovations. And it is, it's almost a meme at this point to say the law has not kept up. It's certainly not kept up with, with internet growth and, and uh, and the destabilization, frankly, to the democracy. I should also add that, sorry, as a government official, I'm not endorsing Uber. I'm just giving an example of ride sharing. So lots of great developments. It's also like, Lyft. Like Lyft too, right? I like all of them. No, actually, I think they're all great. So <laughs> have to be careful. So all of them. Yes. <laughs> so Dane Snowden mentioned uh, smart cities. So I'm going to ask the question that everyone in the room wants to ask, which is, Smart cities are fine. When are we going to have smart airplanes? <laughs> that is to say, is, is, is there a problem with conflicting of, of, of federal agencies in terms of, 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 of being able to sit on, on an airplane 30,000 feet in the air and have the same kind of connectivity that, that we would have in our living room or, or our, our office? Where, where is this going? People, I think people have a hard time understanding exactly, exactly whether this is some kind of a, uh, some kind of a, 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 of a risk averse of, of bias to improvements in connectivity on, uh, on airlines. Is it, is, it, uh, is it jealousies among federal agencies? What, what's, what's, everybody here flies, and so I'm just, I'm just wondering what's, well, what's going to happen and what's the answer? No. 
I wish I had the answer. I may turn to Jamie, see if she has any comments, but I can tell you from when I was at the FCC, when this issue came up of, of connectivity on the planes, particularly uh, voice calls on planes, I think I found myself on the third level of hell dealing with this issue. And this is, you've never seen flight attendants in the Flight Attendant Association so angry before in my entire life. You know, it, it, we all want to, to, to stay connected. And it's something, I spend my life on planes as well, and I, I use the GoGo, -Go, whatever it's called, GoGo -Go in flight. In flight. Yeah. Uh, Which doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Half the time it doesn't work. Even if, even if you want to pay for it, you, it doesn't work. Go ahead. I, 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 I think the technology is, I think the technology is getting better and better um, every day. And it's, I think we'll be amazed in time as it, as it goes. But it's, it's, a lot of it is, is federal agencies and a lot of it is just what consumers themselves want. Yeah. I'm sidestepping that. I have no basically. update about snakes on a plane. Yeah. I'm sorry to say. Uh, I do laugh because actually I know Commissioner Carr has strong feelings. I hope he's not watching the live stream. Uh, I'm not going to share them, but I would urge those of you who uh, get in a room with him to ask him about it because he might, <laughs> he might tell you about it. So. All right, we have, uh, we're gonna open the floor to, uh, to, to questions, and uh, uh, the only rule is that these have to be, uh, have to be real, real questions and not, and not statements. And with that, yes, sir. Uh, I'm the uh, consumer class action lawyer. And actually, there's, there is a microphone here, so, yeah. I'm a consumer class action lawyer, and virtually all of our clients are having huge problems with the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Um, the guidance from the FCC is outdated, it's unclear, it doesn't allow companies to come up with policies that allow them to avoid these lawsuits. And now there are all these new technologies coming into play that the rules really don't address, like direct to voicemail messages, for example. And I'm just curious, and I, I suppose this is probably a question for Jamie, is, is this something that's high on the agenda at the FCC? Can we look forward to some reform? So our office has to defer to Chairman Pai to set the agenda. That's not me sidestepping. It is to say, um, I hear you. I take many, many, many meetings on this um, with many associations and many companies, and I have now for many years. Um, we hear you, and obviously um, with the ACA International decision a few months ago in the D.C. Circuit, there is some lingering uncertainty. So. Um, you know, I believe at some point the commission will have to step in to clarify said uncertainty, but I'm not able, because I don't work for the chairman, to share when that will be um, and what that will look like. But, you know, we hear you and I, I understand, right? Nobody wants robocalls, but there are legitimate um, business purposes and there are consumer-friendly ways to receive said calls and texts. I get them myself, so... Um, we hear the concerns, and I don't think they're falling on deaf ears. Anyone want to comment on that? All right, other, other questions? Okay, right over here on the side, yes. Yes. Hi, um, I am not a lawyer, so you're not alone. <laughs> I am, an, however, an engineer, and I work for a company that makes products. And so my question, I think, is more directed towards Jamie, and that has to do with harmonization of standards. So if we make a product that we need to, clear, we need to get permission from the FCC for the US, and we do that exact same product with similar but yet different rules for like Europe, and again for other countries, having to do the exact same thing four different ways makes it relatively expensive. We're talking tens of thousands of dollars per country. So in the idea or the vein of trying to relax some of the standards, how closely is the FCC working with other countries to harmonize standards so we can do the test once and ship to multiple countries rather than having to do it over and over and over again? So I will fully admit to you that this is not an issue that I've heard too much about. Um, we have excellent, excellent staff in our Office of Engineering and Technology that deal with questions like this. And um, I don't want to say to refer you to them to uh, make this sound like I'm not listening, but they're actually very, very good. And so I think that they would be the proper people to address an inquiry like that. And to the extent that this is something they don't know about, I think they'd probably be open to hearing your concerns and chatting with you about them. Yeah. 
Just to put a plug for my industry, we have uh, Cable Labs, which is based out in Denver, and they do a lot of these standards to look at definitely in the U.S. and also beyond. So I'm not sure what field you're looking into, but I would point you in that direction as well. I think the question highlights a very significant issue that folks in all parts of technology are facing, which is a perhaps a lack of representation of our country and some of the bodies that are making these standards. So something to watch out for. I'll also just comment that 40% of the world still drives on the left side and 60% on the right side. <laughs> And if you take your electric shaver to Europe and plug it in, it'll melt. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that it's fair to, 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 to lay that blame on, on, on telecommunications. <laughs> uh, questions? Yes. Does anyone have a proposed solution, short term, that also works in the long term to protect individual privacy? in the electronic communications world? Yes, we do. <laughs> Huge question, and I'm sure each of you will have some salient comments on privacy, what's happening. So the Center for Democracy and Technology has advocated for omnibus federal privacy law in the United States for all of its 25 years of existence. When I was in the Bush administration, we worked on this. When I was at General Electric and Amazon and DoubleClick and a number of other companies all support some measure of baseline harmonized standards for all of the reasons that we've already discussed here, a, a lack of certainty not only for the consumers but for companies in the United States and the growing lack of harmonization worldwide on these standards. So we have a draft bill and actually we'll be introducing it in the next several weeks. We've been working with companies, including some represented here, uh, other members of civil society, academia, and a number of members of Congress. It will put some limitations on onward transfer, secondary use, and third party uh, transfers of data. And as I said, it will discuss issues of uh, both the intimate and immutable details of in human existence. So uh, with uh, any more than that, you'll have to come to some of our meetings. <laughs> We've made the, the point on privacy over and over again that no matter what happens, and we want consistency uh, with everyone. So it has to include the entire ecosystem. It doesn't make sense for a regulatory agency or the Congress or whoever it might be to put rules on, say, our, our industries uh, and then leave the back door open with the, with the big tech. It does, it does not add up. Consumers don't, don't go online that way. We've even seen one of our company's charter communications has gone as far as to say that they would even support an opt-in strategy for, for data. So we are being aggressive on this issue. We think it's a, it's a very serious one. We think consumers are much more aware of this than they were before. But what I think it's lost is the whole ecosystem, not just one segment of it. And we have to have the whole ecosystem for this to work. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. And I think um, consumers really don't know. They don't understand you know, what's, the, what's the carrier versus what's the tech piece on the privacy, and I do think there needs to be a holistic approach to, to privacy. And, you know, California just passed a, a very comprehensive and, frankly, very burdensome uh, privacy law that I think has forced uh, the tech community in particular uh, to th rethink uh, <laughs> their positioning on, on uh, privacy. And so, uh, I, you know, I'm hopeful that maybe, uh, you know, we'll see federal legislation in this space too, because I think it, it's needed. And th this is also an era where, I'm sorry, Jenny, this right. is also an era where the Federal Trade Commission plays a significant role, or can play a significant role, because they have jurisdiction over everybody in, in, right. in this particular area. The FTC has certain jurisdiction, but the FTC is, a, is an area that, that should look at this issue, uh, and I believe they are starting to look at this issue as well. So yeah, I will second the um, FTC mention. So um, as Chairman Pai mentioned, and you all know, um, last year, we repealed the 2015 uh, net neutrality rules that had been put in place by the Wheeler administration. And um, sort of as a corollary to that, through various legal finaglings, uh, the FTC now has its rightful spot back, as, as my boss would say, the premier consumer protection agency in the country, rightfully so. Um, so, you know, I think from the FCC 
eighth floor perspective, uh, you know, people are very interested in this topic, but uh, we believe the FTC is the agency best position to work with the industry. This is what they've been doing for years. They're the most knowledgeable. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think Congress sent us a strong message a year or two ago, um, back when we dealt with the broadband privacy CRA legislation that um, this was not our space. So clearly it is very important and I think um, we're all following it closely, but uh, FTC. <laughs> Question? Yes, over here, there's Mike. Hi there, uh, I was wondering if some of you could speak to uh, the issue of the European Union um, aggressively pursuing U.S. companies, such as, for example, trying to apply the right to be forgotten um, to worldwide tech, tech searches, um, uh, to, to worldwide internet searches, as well as uh, trying to levy fines on, on worldwide wide revenue. What do you guys think the appropriate private and public sector responses are to that? Well, I'm happy to start with that. We are deeply concerned about the right to be forgotten framework in Europe. Um, CDT's other half of the house, in addition to, to privacy, is freedom of expression and First Amendment issues. And um, the idea that one can delete one's own the history, including truthful, accurate information about yourself. We've already seen in the metrics about who has required or requested those takedowns of Google and other uh, uh, search engines, it's been mostly people of privilege, people with the money to, to make those requests, people with the time and the resources, and, and high-level members of governments who want things embarrassing to their reputation erased. Um, we, we, we certainly also don't want private sector actors to become the librarians of history. So we're deep, very concerned about putting the burden and the onus on private sector actors to engage in censorship that would really be troublesome, certainly if it was engaged in by government actors as well. Um, I think the speech issues that we deal with and the speech issues that confront companies of all kinds in the coming decades are going to be among the hardest for the internet community. Um, and you've seen just in recent days, Facebook saying it's not gonna go back into China because of the concerns around free expression and privacy requests from the government. Um, that's sort of a moot issue since they're currently banned in China, but it's still a good statement. Um, and so, you know, these these are the hardest. And and the move kind of away from traditional notions of the First Amendment in our own country is a concerning trend as well. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, to take the question. To move a little from privacy towards security, kind of the, the other side of the coin, um, 5G, while incredibly exciting, we, we've heard a great deal of it, uh, poses very serious real life consequences to security. Uh, smart cities, uh, connected cars, and uh, kind of more connectivity than we've ever thought of. What can we do to uh, not to get kind of technical here, but you know, big security into the spectrum, I into that connectivity, uh, sec DevOps in the real world, if you would. Um, because if we don't, it seems to me that we're going to have very serious consequences uh, in the real world from cyberspace. So, thank you. Anybody? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I am not an engineer. I'm a lawyer, okay? But I do know in the standards process around 5G, some of those issues are being taken into consideration. And, and uh, you're right, security is really important. There's a lot of overlap between security and privacy in these areas. So, um, you know, my understanding is that 5G is a more secure technology than we have today. And, uh, you know, so, um, but those, those issues are important. You know, one of the areas that we have supported is, is uh, the focus of legislation that will allow the companies to share this information among, among themselves. That will help, uh, help us curtail some of this. It will help us understand more of this as a collective community. So that is one step, but it's, you're raising a, there's a larger issue here, but that is one step to get us closer to where you're trying to go. All right, question? Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, for both privacy and data security, I was wondering what is the market failure that requires you know, strong government regulation, central planning? You know, normally, in any other industry, if a company doesn't cater to my needs, I'll go to another company, it'll go out of business. What's the, what's the reason that people seem to think that strong regulation is needed here? I would argue the tipping point really came with the Cambridge Analytica revelations, that data had gone so far afield from the primary purpose of the transaction for which the individual had given their data to the first party that was so far removed from the intent of the individual and the opacity of the relationship. So as I, as I said before, I think the notice and choice regime, while helpful in, in helping companies understand how they're using their own data and how, what data assets it has, um, it's become untenable for the individual consumer to read. You would spend literally days a year reading privacy policies to truly understand and then not have adequate choice really to do business with enough alternatives in some of the markets we're talking about. Um, but I do see it as a failure to um, respect and understand the rights of the individual in that transaction and the kind of contract of adhesion that we have with most of the larger companies that we do business with. And the other thing I would say in, in this space from a, a company standpoint, I mean, having some certainty, I mean, this is an area where I think uh, at least we may embrace regulation because otherwise we're dealing with a class action bar and a lot of uncertainty. And if there is uh, some guidance given to business on what they have to do uh, to stay out of out of trouble, I think uh, businesses would welcome that in this in this area, uh, given the litigious nature uh, that's out there. I would just add that, that I think what people are looking for mostly is transparency and understanding what, what is happening to my data. All right, who's furthest in the back? I'm trying to see here. All right, <laughs> yes. Good afternoon. This question is more for Ms. Suskin. Uh, yesterday, Mercatus uh, blogged about an interesting case involving microsatellites. Um, involving, there was a company that had, had applied to the FCC. The FCC turned them down. Uh, there were some issues. They thought it was corrected. They then, because it was taking too much time, they went to India and launched the satellite. Hmm. Needless to say, the Indian Space Agency sent a memo to all American companies saying, please, talk to the FCC, we don't want this to happen again. Given the fact that Chairman Pai had talked about, yeah. you know, the regulations and, you know, improving the regulations, with the issue of satellites and space, you also have to deal with, not only with foreign countries, but you also have to deal with export and import control issues. Um, how does the, F what is the FCC's approach or what are you envisioning to try to address these issues now that we are talking about micro satellites going into orbit now? Thank you. So I don't want to tell you that this isn't my portfolio, but it's not my portfolio. <laughs> you want to talk about TCPA, I can talk about TCPA. Um, so I'm unfamiliar with the Mercatus blog, but I will look at it um, and I will refer it to my boss and I'm happy to take your card after and get back to you with an answer to your question. Um, I just hadn't heard of it before, but it sounds like an interesting one worth looking into. Anyone have a comment on that? Okay. Yes. T-Mobile's not in space yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> so uh, this uh, 5G is basically like a much bigger pipe that's going to allow a lot more data to go to our end devices. Have you thought at all about the potential implications for denial of service attacks or worms or viruses that could overload the systems of our devices with these larger pipes? Yeah, yeah. Well, it is it is more lanes, uh, that's for sure. But I think some of those some of those problems exist today, right? Even with smaller lanes. So, uh, absolutely, uh, that's a, an important area. It's an area where we have uh, teams of people who work that, who make sure that the bad bad guys don't get in. Uh, but it's tough. A lot of this is coming from overseas. Uh, I do think, I think Dane made this point that some good practices uh, shared amongst the carriers and with the government uh, is another area of, of I think, uh, you know, strength here if we can, if we can uh, 
uh, ensure that I think there's more cooperation across and, and learnings from some of this. Uh, in the past, there's been more of a, you know, if, there, if you encounter that problem, you're going to get punished. And uh, believe me, the, the carriers don't want these bad people coming in their back door. Believe me, we don't. Uh, but it's, it's tough. It's tough. So um, I... Uh, and this goes back to my point about needing legislation to make sure we can share information. Uh, because the more information we can share, the more we can handle these issues uh, on a more timely basis. In our offices, if, by the way, if anyone's near 25 Massachusetts, please swing by, swing by our offices. We have in our, um, one of our innovation centers this big monitor that shows you all the attacks that are going on. And it's amazing. And you see them concentrated in certain parts of the world, certain governments of the world who are doing these attacks. You know who they are. And it is, it is something that as we build out and move from the, the one gig world that we're in, all are trying to move to the 10G world that we're going to, we, we are concentrated on this issue um, every single day. Uh, but it's, it is something that I'd say that all the companies are involved in, but also the government's involved in as well. But we need to be able to share information with each other. So my question is something of a compliment to the questions about cybersecurity, and that is, would anyone like to speak to hardening of physical infrastructure? And that could be something as, you know, kind of out there as EMP or something as relatively common as hurricanes. Mm -hmm. A few million cell phones lose signal, that's an inconvenience. A few million autonomous vehicles lose signal, and that could obviously be much more significant. So. So um, Commissioner Carr actually went, I guess it was two weeks ago now, down to the Florida Panhandle um, following the damage from Hurricane Michael. Um, and you know what he saw, I think, was astounding, just the level of damage. Um, and he was able to spend some time with some of the providers that are on the ground and trying to get the networks up and running. He, um, I will refer you to, he put a Medium post out that sort of shares his thoughts in more detail. but. Um, one observation that he made, and he reiterated yesterday to some members of the press, was dealing with um, basically line cuts when the networks are being restored, that there needs to be better coordination between the telecom providers and the electric utilities. So you know you don't get your telecom network back up and running, and then by mistake, you know an electric utility comes and cuts the line because we do actually see that with various hurricane situations. I understand that was a problem down in Puerto Rico. Um, last year during the um, you know, horrific hurricanes they had down there. So I think that's something he actually would like to look into further. Um, not to say that there's regulation needed, but you know, to the degree that we can help with coordination or help people figure out what's what, um, that's something that he mentioned is important. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, from the, our experience in the panhandle uh, there as well, I think, um, you know, a lot of these cell sites have to be connected to electricity, and we do have backup power. Uh, but uh, having better coordination with the utility companies, I think, would be helpful a lot of times. Uh, and it varies. I mean, it's utility by utility, you know, depending on the location. So uh, there are some good practices out there. I do know that from T-Mobile's philosophy on this that uh, we look to work with the other carriers uh, during this time. Numerous occasions we've opened up our network to roaming. Uh, there's a lot of good practices out there across uh, just the, the carriers helping each other. Uh, and, and um, you know, there's a lot of benefit to that. So I'm not sure, you know, regulation is the, the solution there because you want to make sure that the, the, the carriers are incented to use the very best practices and sometimes regulation is, is not going to uh, deal with the next new thing that's out there to, to solve these things. So uh, there are a lot of, uh, CTIA has, a, has an industry pact, if you will, uh, to deal with these sort of things, uh, which the uh, carriers have all signed up to, to help coordinate and uh, work with the, uh, each other on disasters. But we don't have the equivalent of that with the utility companies, uh, and that, that's kind of a gap. I understand that Chairman Pai is looking into the wireless resiliency framework, correct? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and so my boss is interested in following that and sort of seeing where that goes, so. Yeah. All right, and here in front. Yeah. 
Patricia Pauletta, Harris, Fulcher, and Granis. It's not a question, but just since there were a couple of 5G security questions, I just, it's a public service announcement that there's a trade association called 5G Americas. It's operators and vendors. T-Mobile is one of them, and they've just put out a white paper on 5G security, and even though it is written by engineers, the intent is that it's comprehensible to, you know, the lay person, <laughs> probably most lawyers. of you lawyers. No, lawyers too. I, I had to read it. I understood it. So you, know, you can get that on their website, 5Gamericas.org. For those of you who have questions about how 5G will be more secure and some of the technology involved in that. Oh, that's great, Trish. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, anyone else toward the back? I just want to be sure I see hands back there. All right, this gentleman here. Does the advent of 5G effectively end the net neutrality debate? Um, and I want to premise that by reminding us of the, the fact that we're going to be enjoying far greater access to spectrum bands that were not available in the past for, for 3G and 4G, um, and the exceptionally higher speed internet that we're all going to be enjoying. So will carriers like T-Mobile and others even need to throttle, even need to block uh, abusers um, of, of bandwidth? Um, will you need to have fast lanes and slow, slow lanes and paid prioritization, and if not, do we even, is there a, a, any argument left in favor of pro net neutrality side? Well, just to be clear, we don't throttle <laughs> and we don't block, okay? So uh, we do manage our networks, and you're right, you know, you have you had limited uh, uh, capacity uh, based on, and look, uh, Everybody's network is different. We're using different frequency bands. We have different spectrum in different locations. We have different number of cell sites. Uh, and so this is the real difference actually between a wire and a wireless on some level because our networks are uh, constrained by those assets, you know. And if you have a situation where you have a lot of people uh, highly concentrated, you know, we have in T for T-Mobile, like in New York City, I think we have cell sites on, literally on every block in New York City. Uh, and we have multiple cell sites in every block in New York City. And we need that dense network because there are a lot of people using, thank God, they're using our phones. So, um, you know, so uh, that, that, is, that is something uh, that Spectrum helps. It definitely does help. Um, uh, and I think some of the, the technologies to leading to more spectral efficiency help too, with our, our, the handsets are getting better, the technology is getting better. Uh, uh, I, you know, whether it will mean that we don't have to manage our networks anymore in terms of the use of that spectrum, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I think it will still but again, I, I don't see those as you know, blocking and throttling. It's when you're in a congested cell site and everybody gets on, you ha sometimes have to limit uh, the availability just to, we call it prioritization, so that everybody gets on. You know, it's like I like to talk about you know, the food line, you know, the all-you-can-eat food line, and one guy comes in and eats all the, the food and there's not left, and nothing left for anybody else. That's what we call uh, good, good network management to make sure everybody gets some food from the table. So um, anyhow. And just to be clear on from the ISP point of view, we don't block and we don't <laughs> throttle either. I uh, just want anyone to be confused by that. Um, you know, to answer your question, will this solve the net neutrality debate? Um, no. Uh, what will solve it is a bipartisan approach looking at the substantive policy issues that we're talking about versus the political side that this is, delved into, this is developed into. That will help solve this issue. We need something. And I think we as, as you all as lawyers and we all as consumers, we need something that will survive a regime change no matter which regime that is. It, it is time. This is issue's been going on for close to 20 years. I've had three different jobs and the same issue and we're at the exact same result. And so that's what we need to have. It's, it's time for us to actually roll our sleeves up, stop making this a political issue, and focus on the policy issues of how we go forward. No one's into blocking and throttling. That isn't good for anybody. We're into making sure that consumers have their resources and services and can enjoy the internet the way they want to. Our question? 
Thanks. Um, my understanding of blocking and throttling is that if these companies were willing to do that, then it would help break the advertising duopoly that's currently held by Google and Facebook who do a fair amount of their own blocking and throttling to control what consumers see first and foremost when they get online. I think Wall Street Journal reported that between Google and Facebook, something like 98% or at least no, oh, more than 90% of advertising revenue gets channeled to those companies. And it seems to me that if someone was interested in promoting a product or service and they had an effective alternative to Google and Facebook that could be provided through blocking and throttling, for instance, giving a consumer a slight discount if they traffic uh, one media website instead of another media website or, or other creative solutions, um, is it possible for Google and Facebook to be challenged through intelligent and consumer friendly blocking and throttling strategies if someone were to choose to want to do that? I, I have no idea, but I'm gonna be very clear, we're not in the business of doing that. We don't wanna be in that business and that's not something we, we will do. You're right about the, the stranglehold they have on advertising, um, but it is not our goal as an industry, and I think I can speak for Kathleen and CTIA as well, to get in the business of blocking and, and throttling uh, consumers. All right. Further questions? Yes. Uh, is there any plan or active ideas about liberating spectrum that's currently in the hand, that's currently underutilized? Uh, we talked about TV earlier. Are there some other bands or is there other uh, active approaches that would allow spectrum uh, users to use it in a broader way. Some spectrum uh, uh, bands are, uh, have very strict regulations about how they can currently be used. Uh, are there some active uh, uh, measures that are being talked about to uh, create some more flexibility within particular bands? Yeah, I mean, spectrum management, that's a big part of uh, the FCC's function and um, an NTIA that manages the fe uh, federal portfolio. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, right now, for example, I'll pick on the satellite industry. Uh, satellite industry doesn't always make good use of its spectrum. Uh, maybe it needs to um, rethink that. Uh, and maybe there's some efficiencies that can be brought there. Uh, uh, a lot of federal spectrum. I mean, T-Mobile went through um, the AWS Advanced Wireless Service Auction back in 2007, I think it was, and we bought a bunch of spectrum that was occupied by the federal government, and we spent two years clearing that. I was sort of shocked at uh, what the federal government was doing with some of that spectrum just in terms of the types of technology. They are using a lot of analog technology, for example, that... Uh, is a real spectrum hog uh, as opposed to digital. And uh, so some of that, uh, you know, I think the challenge with the government spectrum use is, you know, it takes, it takes funding oftentimes to transition them to better technology, more efficient use. And, uh, you know, we had in that auction, we had some money set aside for the federal government to do that, and it was a win-win in the sense that they were able to transition to oftentimes to some uh, much better technology, more, much more spectral efficient technology. Uh, with the broadcasters, likewise, they're being repacked, and uh, as they've gone to digital, they, have, they, have, they need to use less spectrum. So technology definitely helps to, to solve some of those problems. Uh, but it's very valuable stuff, Spectrum, that people are sitting on, and they don't often easily give, want to give it up, you know. And this is where the, the FCC comes into play and tries to, uh, I think, give them a little bit of a nudge. Congress, uh, several years ago, gave, uh, you know, adopted incentive auction authority for the FCC, which is what enabled them to do the 600 megahertz repack with the broadcasters, which was they get some payment for giving up their spectrum. Um, you know, and these, a lot of these folks are people that got the spectrum for, for free, you know, but uh, paying them to get off of it's, I think, a, a benefit because it, it uh, get, frees that spectrum up for newer uh, and better uses, frankly, things that co consumers are demanding, so. I mean, you would have heard Chairman Pai at least um, 
allude to some of the active proceedings we have ongoing at the commission to free up both mid-band and um, high-band millimeter wave spectrum. I think he mentioned that yesterday the commission launched the first auction of millimeter wave um, spectrum, which is thought could be used for future 5G uses. Um, so, that, you know, the administration at the agency is definitely thinking about this. Um, it's a very high priority, I would say, for them. Um, as far as the government users, um, you know, I know we coordinate with NTIA closely. Um, there was an interesting bill, doesn't mean I'm like passing on whether it's good or bad, that came out yesterday, Senators um, Lee, and I think it was Senator Markey, that would require federal agencies to basically put a value on their spectrum holdings. Um, it's a concept that's been around for a while. We sort of fought about it when I was a Senate staffer. Um, it's very interesting, so um, it might be something worth looking into a little more. I would also add that, as, as we've mentioned, we're nearing a, a crisis in the Wi-Fi unlicensed spectrum bands. And I think it, it's very si simple. More spectrum equals more Wi-Fi, and that's what consumers want. And so we look at the 5.9 band, unlicensed band, which is a, a key area that we need to make sure that we can grow that and use that for our, our, our use in our industry. So this is just an historical relic, but you probably never noticed how many ABC stations are channel seven? <laughs> Does anyone know why that is? It's because in the early days of television, uh, it was, there, was a, there was a big gap on the spectrum between channel six and seven, and uh, it was generally thought that the federal government was gonna grab channels two through six for their own use, so ABC thought it was super smart, and it went out and claimed all the channel all the channel sevens, thinking that would be the lowest channel, and then of course the uh, the, the feds changed their mind and, and and released channels two through six. I'm sure that some of you here on the panel know more about that than I do, and you can correct me if it's wrong. And the feds also reserved UHF channel 37, which nobody ever used. It was supposed to be for national security, and it was totally wasted for wasted for decades. So these 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 things go on and on and on, and they never get they never get fixed. Um, any other questions from anyone? So I, I'll invite it. If, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh -huh. right over here. For a long time, rural places have lagged with the different technologies we've talked about. I'm interested in what each of the panelists think the future looks like for rural places, especially as rural America gets less populated and even more rural than it is now. Mm. I'm really glad you asked that question because we, uh, that's one of the reasons why we wanted that 600 megahertz spectrum. As I said, you know, it's, it makes it more affordable to, to build out in rural areas. Uh, we also are very excited, again, I'll put another plug in for my merger, but uh, that, that, that spectrum, the combination of, of Sprint and T-Mobile is gonna enable us in a lot of those rural areas with their 2.5 spectrum to have deeper capacity which may mean you know, we would be an alternative uh, for rural broadband in those areas. So that's something we're very excited about. We put some really good uh, data in, into the FCC record on that. And uh, so, because I agree with you, in a lot of those in rural America, there's a, a lack of choice. Uh, and um, you know, wireless is a really good alternative I think in, in uh, rural America. And for us, we're, we are, as I mentioned earlier, looking at uh, redoing our networks and expanding our networks and moving from the, the one gig world that we're in now to hopefully to get to a 10 gig world, uh, 10 G world. So I would also say that it's important to think through what's going on right now with all the infrastructure dollars that are being put out there. And there's a lot of talk about um, how to use those monies, et cetera. Our goal is to make sure that we use them where there is no service, not where there is some, but where there is no service, and that'll help solve some of that issue as well. I'm so glad you asked the question because it raises issues of inequality, and particularly as a mom, I look at how much my kids are reliant and how many of their assignments come with a requirement that they get online for a certain website or whatever. As we don't have equality in access and provision of services in a number of parts of this country, we always look at the rest of the world and say we're doing so well, but we've got some real issues of access right here at home. We've, we've really got to think about whether we're going to end up with a two-tiered system of kind of access to the internet. I actually, I actually feel very optimistic about where we're headed. Um, 
Chairman Pai has said before that, that the agency's number one priority right now is closing the digital divide. And I believe that the members of the commission um, all genuinely believe in achieving that goal. So um, probably half this room will get upset about the idea of universal service subsidies so we don't have to fight about it. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think that's one piece of the puzzle and it actually has proven to be helpful in unserved areas. Um, we recently concluded an auction that will give um, about a billion and a half dollars to further deploy in um, unserved areas. So I think that that is a good step in the right direction. Um, another piece of the puzzle, which my boss feels strongly about, and I've said here today, is just streamlining our regulations, removing the red tape, and um, you know, letting the innovators do what they do best. And I think we are seeing results, um, as I said in my remarks. Right, like 5G doesn't have to just be in California. It doesn't just have to be in New York City. Right. Um, we've seen small cells going up in places like Sioux Falls, in suburbs of Indianapolis. Um, so he feels strongly that that too will help folks in not just urban America. Again, from my standpoint, it, um, it's very expensive to, to cover those areas. And you, could do, you can do it with uh, government subsidies, uh, but you can also do it with private investment if you have the scale to do it. And that's what our deal is about, okay? So it's about doing it through private investment. We have a couple of minutes left. If any of the panelists have anything that hasn't been touched on or any kind of uh, response that you'd like to uh, make to anything that's been said or anything that we've left out? If not, and if there are no further questions, then, well, it's all right, go, go, go ahead. We, we, we have time for just one more, Going I think, once, so that's fine. Twice. Sorry, this might be a little off from what we've hit on so far, but I'm, cons I'm wondering from like a consumer privacy and information perspective, um, I'm thinking of the issues where you have like microphone access to your phone where people are thinking that their microphone access is off and then suddenly an ad pops up and they're in the middle of the Himalayas and they're, you know, they had no service to have any microphone access. So where do you see this issue? Is this an issue of like the apps themselves and where do you see the accountability coming in in this area? Wonderful, wonderful to end on that topic because I, <laughs> I, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled by all the excitement about privacy and, and it really, as it moves inside the curtilage of our homes and into the most intimate parts of our lives, we've got to have some rules of the road for good actors, for good corporate actors and for individuals to know what is going to be used about them and what not only the data that is collected, but the decisions that are made about them. So what you see online, what you are experiencing in the world, um, you know, there's a there's certainly a theory that the internet is to blame for the decisions we make politically in this country or in the rest of the world. I don't think we can give them the internet actors all of them credit. There's plenty of information coming to us from television and radio and the like. But I think all actors in the ecosystem have to uh, behave in service of their customers and in service of the democracy. And so those are the issues we're working on. Um, I happened to work on the uh, Amazon Echo when I was at Amazon. I'm happy to tell you offline all of the secrets of how it works. But <laughs> Thanks to the panel and to everyone for your participation and attention.